please give a warm welcome to Professor Robles. Hello, everybody. Um, let's see, this is going to work. Thank you, Hamid. Um, I always uh, don't um, see myself as a professor, and it sounds very weird. <laughs> I told him not to call me professor, but he insisted. Anyway, um, so I'm going to talk about a biological problem. As um, Hamid mentioned, I'm working for many years in the field of chronobiology, and um, I first did a postdoc study in chronobiology at the molecular mechanism, and then I moved to the group of Matthias Mann, where I started using proteomics to answer some questions in this field. And uh, Jorgen um, kindly invited me to, to give you uh, this talk as an example of how you can use proteomics and how can you do computational proteomics to analyze a tan series uh, data, data set. In this case, it's not um, in, in minutes or in seconds as a signaling, for example, process, but it's, it's about uh, 24 hours. <coughs> So I'm going to give you a little bit of introduction to go into the topic. Somebody took it out. One second. Uh, well, I, th I guess you know um, all that we live in this uh, oscillating environment due to the rotation of the Earth. And we have very clear 12 hours, sometimes depends on the time of the year, but we have clearly two phases in our day, so a dark and a light phase. Phase, and it's not only so. These two phases are not only different by by the light, but also, of course, at night we have lower temperature than in the day. So there are clearly um, many environmental factors that are changing in 24 hours manner. And during uh, during evolution, most of the animals that are living or were living on, on the surface of the Earth develop an internal timing system that allow them to really predict these changes. In this way, they can anticipate what is going to happen the next day in a very optimal way to adapt their metabolism and the physiology. And this internal timing system is called circadian clocks. Um, another example for you, and maybe you are very unconsciously uh, feeling this, but there are so many metabolic processes that are actually driving or ticking in a 24-hour manner in our bodies. And I represent some of the key um, processes that have a, a rhythm of 24 hours. And in the middle of the night, we have the lowest body temperature. And uh, also, um, uh, just before we are going to wake up, um, we have a rise in blood pressure. Melatonin, which is a hormone that controls sleep, as many of you know, uh, stops to be secreted at the beginning of the day, so when we are going to uh, get up, and then that's why you know, this is driving us to be active. Um, then uh, between 10 and noon, we have the peak of high alert, uh, alertness, and I'm very happy to give my talk at this peak. So hopefully, despite the drinks of last night, you are going to uh, listen to me in a very um, alert way. Anyway, so a bit after noon, we have uh, the, the peak of best coordination, and around two, uh, between, yeah, Two on, on five, we have the greatest cardiovascular efficiency. So some people say this is the, the great or the good moment to go to, to exercise. And then, um, so the highest, so the peak of temperature, body pr uh, blood pressure comes a little bit in the evening, just before we have uh, dinner. Way, actually, many hours before we have dinner in Spain, actually. But <laughs> and then uh, melatonin secretion starts to be um, oh, melatonin starts to be secreted around nine, and then actually we start to be um, slowly sleepy due to the mel melatonin. Um, I guess many of you also had heard that uh, this um, biological field, chronobiology, and the study of, uh, of the seminal studies of three groups in, in the States, uh, Je Jeffrey Hall, Michael Rosbas, and Michael Jan, had actually um, had the great pressure to, to be uh, granted with the Nobel Prize last year. So I think for our field, which is a relatively small and new field, this was a great thing. And these three people really pushed the field, and they were the three uh, labs that really connected, so for the first time, they connect mutations in, in genes to behavioral aspects. And um, so 
I'm very happy to actually talk about this topic here. Anyway, so I'm going to concentrate in mammals. So uh, actually, these three groups uh, develop most of the work in, in Drosophila. This is also a very nice, and they're very happy to get a Nobel Prize using an um, animal model that these days they always complain that they don't have opportunities to get grants because you know, nobody cares about Drosophila. But actually, maybe this is a good example that even using animal models that are not maybe so appreciated these days, you know, you can also get a Nobel Prize. So I'm going to concentrate in, in mammals. And uh, as I mentioned, so we have this internal timing system. These circadian clocks are present in, in virtually every cell and every organ in mammals. And the mammals have this, this system has a hierarchical uh, structure. So we have a suprachiasmatic nucleus in the brain, and it's actually called suprachiasmatic because it's just underneath the, the chiasma of the, the two um, um, optic nerves here. And this uh, nucleus is, uh, is located in the hypothalamus and contains in each hemisphere 10,000 neurons. So then these neurons are kicking every 24 hours, but the good th or the important things of these neurons is that they get direct input from the light. So this internal clock is kicking constantly, regardless of how any environmental input. But of course, you know, it doesn't make sense that we have an internal timing system that is not able to synchronize um, to the environment. That's why the light is received by the eye, is sent through the nervic, uh, nervic optic, uh, so the optic nerves, to these neurons in the suprachiasmatic nucleus, and then the, the internal timings, which is normally in, in mice is a little bit shorter, 24 hours, in humans is a bit longer, there is actually synchronizing to, to the light changes. Otherwise, we will never really get rid of the jet lag when we travel, right? So light is very important to synchronize uh, the, uh, the internal clock of these neurons in the suprachiasmatic nucleus. So this nucleus is also called, called the master clock, sends uh, meta metabolized hormones on cytokines, many rhythmic signals through different uh, so through nerve, uh, or innervation and also um, hormonal system to peripheral clocks. So we call peripheral clocks, every organ has a clock. And then these rhythmic signals are actually a coordinating input. So every uh, organ is, is kicking, but of course, thanks to these rhythmic signals from the brain, every organ is in synchrony with the rest of the organs in the, in the body. So as I mentioned, um, there are other environmental cues that are important for synchronizing these internal clocks. And uh, in the case of metabolic tissues like the liver, pancreas, and um, um, stomach, and actually intestine, food intake is, is one of the, the key input or cues, environmental cues for synchronizing the clocks. And actually, it's very interesting because you can have a mouse in a cage that have LiDAR cycles. Uh, but then you provide food in antiphase to the LiDAR cycle. So mice are nocturnal, normally they're active and eating at night. So if you only provide food at, during the day when they're supposed to be eating, of course you push them to eat during the day because they're very hungry. <laughs> and then you can actually have a mouse who are, have uh, the suprachiasmatic nucleus is running in phase to the LiDAR cycles, but the metabolic tissues, like the liver, is running in antiphase. So this is actually something very striking. And then these rhythms can be visualized. So we use systems, for example, uh, we uh, put a luciferase under the control of a promoter that is, is being driven in a circadian manner. And we actually can do this in, in culture, in cell culture with cells, but also with explants from tissues. And then we can really follow this by luminescence across days, and you can really see how Lucifer is speaking, you know? And then these rhythms um, can really be maintained up to, to a week. So um, now to consequences, and maybe something that is more important. So um, there are really strong pathological consequences when you disrupt your clock. So there are genetic uh, situations, so there are mutations that we know they are disrupting the clock at the molecular level, but lifestyle is actually a very key, um, basically, the synchronization uh, factor. And I want to make a point here because we live, uh, so animals, of course, in nature live and depends of LiDAR cycles, but you know, we, I think the last uh, maybe 150 years, you know, we are really happy to do. Uh, to do what we want at the time of the day that we want, but actually this actually has a price to pay. And then actually working in shift works, and already I think more than 10 years ago, the World Health Organization declared that um, circadian desynchronization by working as in shifts, constantly changing shifts, is actually an oncogenic factor. 
uh, but also, for example, eating at night and, and getting this amazing blue light from the TV or from the computers and from the iPad is extremely bad because uh, suppressed melatonin secretion and of course then you have problems to uh, sleep and then you keep eating and you keep watching TV. And um, um, this is also all is, is screwing actually your internal clock. So this uh, disruption of circadian rhythms have really pathological consequences. So we know that um, disruption of uh, internal clocks uh, leads to type 2 diabetes and obesity and also has many um, actually uh, consequences in depression and learning and memory impairment and so on. And actually it's very striking because uh, this experiment has been done some years ago in mice, so when you provide food the same amount of calories in mice, but you actually push them to eat in the wrong time of the day, as I say, you know, for example, for us, if we uh, only will have food at night, and this will be these habits, the mice immediately develop, uh, so become obese, even though they're eating the same amount of calories as mice in, a, in the wrong time of the day. So as I mentioned, so these clocks are in every cell and every organ, and what is this really driving these, these cycles? And, and this is actually an amazing system because it's a transcriptional, translational feedback loop. It's a molecular mechanism and it's driving these cycles. So the main uh, factors that are driving this uh, at the molecular level, there are two transcriptional factors, clock and B-mail. These factors, these transcription factors bind to consensus sites and promoters um, called e-boxes. And then they drive the expression or the transcription of many genes. Uh, among the, the, all the genes that are driving, there are uh, two families of repressors, Persa and Christ. It doesn't matter for you that they make a complex in the, um, in the cytoplasm and then they move back into the, to the nucleus where they suppress the transcription of clock and email. Of course, mutations in this, any of these genes uh, has consequences not only in not having uh, oscillations, but also changing the, the length of this oscillation. And it's actually um, separating for these 24 hours. And because I think traditionally, because the main factors of this mechanism are transcription factors, so people have used uh, transcriptomics and uh, nowadays RNA seq and so on. And they really have found that uh, for each single organ, between 10 and 20% of the genome is under circadian regulation, it's oscillating at 24 hour manners. But now, when you actually collect, all the genes that are oscillating in all the organs, you can really get up to 50% of the genome is under circadian control. When I enjoy, I joined Matthias group, nothing was really known about proteins, and for me it was actually something very striking because I mean, regulation of 50% of the genome has to have some consequences. And the question is, like, are you also regulating 50% of the proteome? And this will be an amazing thing because this is happening every day, right? So, um, so, with, uh, so nothing was really known, and not only at the protein level, but also at the post-translational um, um, modification level. So if you really want to control metabolic processes in a 24-hour manner, you maybe don't need to control transcription only, but you also need to control protein abundance and even more important protein function by post-translational modification. So this is already something that I was published some years ago, but I actually go through it uh, quickly just to show you. So this was actually my main question when I joined Matthias. Is this a circadian post-transcriptional mechanism that is controlling protein abundance in, in mouse tissues? And I use liver because it was one of the, well, it's also very big, you can get a lot of material and it was one of the best or most um, uh, profile tissue uh, at the RNA level. So the way I did this, it was using the Silac mouse that was developed by, uh, developed by Marcus Kruger when he was with Matthias Mann. So this mouse, I guess you all know, have this heavy lysine in, in all the proteins. And so what I did, I collect tissues. Um, this is actually working in the circadian field is a bit challenging because you just not do control versus treatment. You have to collect samples every 24 hours. And um, the best way to do is also uh, in two consecutive days, right? To have enough statistical power. So basically, when I did this, I didn't sleep for 24 hours. <laughs> I collect four mice every three hours, day and night, obviously. And then uh, the way we did this experimentally, so we mix uh, every liver sample with a spike silac mice, uh, sample. From, from livers from this uh, Silac mouse, and this was collected in two uh, antiphase uh, time points. We thought it's enough to, to use it as internal um, spiking. And then we analyzed the, so we measured the samples in, in an orbit trap, and we used, of course, the computational platform of uh, Masquan and Perseus. 
So I, here, you know, I jump a little bit back and forth because I think these are parameters maybe are a bit specific for circadian analysis, but you can also use it for any other time series. And I guess you are here to learn how to use Perseus and, and analyze your data or even get ideas from future projects. So um, a couple of years ago, uh, Stefka and, um, and many other uh, group members from, from Jorgan published this very nice paper about Perseus, and one of the figures, they explain the, uh, um, this algorithm to, calc to um, uh, analyze circadian data, but uh, actually you can also use it for any time series uh, data. And then actually they have this very nice figure, and then you can really see, so you have time points here. In this case, it's a circadian cycle. It doesn't matter if it's 24 hours or 10 hours, what you want to look at. And basically what you <clears throat> actually do is you organize, so every time point, you know, you represent it. Uh, and this will be protein expression or phosphorylation levels of a particular peptide. And then basically you just, uh, what you just do is to fit the data to a cosine curve. In this case, you fix the periodicity, what the periodicity that you want to look at. In this case, this is the period length of the mouse, 23.6. And um, basically, the uh, Perseus looks at uh, goodness of the fit to this curve with all the time points. And as um, Jorgen mentioned yesterday, you also have to do a statistical uh, test, you know, what is uh, UP value. In this case, we use FDR because we use randomization. And the way that we randomize the data is basically you do 1,000. Normally, we do, I think we run with 1,000 uh, randomization. So you just scramble the time points and you actually calculate the false discovery rate that by random, uh, randomizing the time points, you know, you get uh, fitness to this curve. So what, what are the parameters that you get in Perseus with this? You can get a phase. A phase, uh, we always, um, in the circadian field, uh, we consider as the peak of, of this curve, or the peak of the expression, or the peak of, of the abundant chains. Amplitude, basically, you know, the difference between maximum and minimum of these chains. Um, actually, important also the FDR to really do a cut of, of your interest. So, how does it look in Perseus? Uh, you have, um, well, the first thing is a bit different. So, um, the time points, when you have a time series analysis, you have to annotate your time points as a numerical annotation. And you have a notation row here. Uh, when you click, you have this menu. Normally, we annotate categories, but in this case, you numerically annotate you know, your time points. So then, <clears throat> when you annotate this, then you go to, to this uh, bottom here. It's called time series. And then you have four options here. And you have this periodicity analysis. And you have this very nice icon uh, here, little uh, figure. So when you click here, you get this uh, window. And then you say you establish the period. You can change this 10 hours, 5 hours, 6 hours, whatever you want to look at. Time column, automatically, when you have annotated your time points as a numerical, it automatically takes this already. So actually, when you don't get any option here, you know, you remember that you didn't annotate your time points as a numerical. This has happened <laughs> several times. And now, um, actually, something that is very uh, practical for me, and I guess maybe for some of you, if you want to do some uh, similar uh, analysis, that you can really have different time series. For example, you can analyze transcriptome and protein in the same, uh, in the same way, but, and you can separate these by groups. So you can say, okay, I actually want to apply all these um, uh, parameters to different time series, and you can have protein series and RNA series all in Perseus in the same matrix. And then the criteria is a cosine fit, and then you can set up your cutoff here, FDR, as, as much as you, you want to be stringent or not. And number of normalizations, by default, you have thousands. Um, and then I normally run with thousands. And then preserve grouping and randomization. I think also Jorga mentioned this yesterday. You have to be actually a bit careful here. If you, uh, if you do have biological replicates, you don't want to preserve. So, Every biological or every sample and every time point you randomize it, but you have technical replicates, you have to preserve this group. So uh, every time point, so for example, if you run for time point zero for uh, technical replicates, you cannot scramble this for technical replicates all across the time series. Okay? So you will have to click here, yes, or, or, or the groups that you have established. Okay, so I, I did this for the protein and go back now to, to the data. So basically when I did this, I found that 6%, more than 6% of the proteins in the liver are oxidating a circadian manner. And you can represent this in these nice hierarchical uh, maps that is uh, organized by phase. So high is blue in this case and yellow is low. And then this is the data that I collect in two consecutive days. This is day and this is night, day and night of the second day. And you can really see 
uh, the power of having two days of collection that, you know, whatever you see in the first day actually happens exactly at the same time in the second day. Um, I was a bit disappointed when I compared to the mRNA because actually two-thirds of these rhythmic proteins have also a transcript that is also oscillating. I thought, wow, I did all, I did all this, you know, to prove nothing because, you know, people have really found it at the transcript level. But actually, when I compare, not only that if they are rhythmic, but it, when they are picking, you know, when the mRNA is picking and the protein is picking, actually, it's a huge difference, you know, between these these uh, peaks. And if you take the whole populations of all the proteins that are cycling with a rhythmic mRNA, I really see that there is a time window between peak of mRNA to peak of protein, and actually that we call global time delay, that's between two and six hours. But there are really some proteins that are really peaking in antiphase to the mRNA. So it's actually something striking. So you create a peak of mRNA, at 12 hours later, the protein is going to be peaking. So it's actually it's a window of 12 hours. Um, so how can you really make this in Perseus? I thought this would be maybe interesting also for you. So you go to the hierarchical clustering um, button, and then uh, the important thing here is that you don't want to cluster the columns because you want to keep them. So when you do the cycling analysis, Perseus keeps actually internally the order of the phase. And then, uh, so you don't want to do a tree of the column because Perseus keeps this phase order. order. And then what you want to do here in the row tree is actually constrain. You want to click here and there is an option that says preserve order and preserve the order of the phase. Uh, this is the only thing is changing here. So you unclick the column tree and then you add here preserve order and you get these nice heat maps based in the phase. Um, so a little bit again, you know, going back to the data. So if I, if I calculate for each protein what is the phase, the peak and the mRNA, if I represent this in a 24-hour manner, so this will be clusters of proteins that are picking, you know, between 6 and 12 and so on. So the total distribution of phases at the protein level, you already see that this is very different from the mRNA level. So clearly, you know, they have a step downstream of the mRNA or transcription that regulates the expression of the proteins, even though tra also these transcripts are cycling. And then I'm going to give you an example, you know, why this is rele relevant. So liver, um, one of the metabolic processes in, a key in liver is detoxification of xenobiotics or drug detoxific detoxification. So we found that a lot of proteins that are involved in different steps of this metabolic process are under circadian regulation at the protein abundance, but also have an mRNA that is also cycling. I represent here... Um, um, a dot is the mRNA that is cycling, and when it's cycling in this 24-hour period, so there is no red dot, it's because this mRNA is not cycling, and then all these proteins are cycling from different enzymes of these metabolic processes. And immediately, as an overlook, uh, you can really see that the peak of the mRNA and the protein is, is actually different. In this case, it's not so different. But overall, you know, you see that the mRNAs are ten, so tend to pick between, you know, at, at the beginning, of, so at the end of the, 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 the day and the beginning of the night, while the proteins, they are all picking, you know, in a window of two, two hours here in the middle of the, of the night. And why is that? Uh, mice are nocturnal and mice are actually eating at night. So this is actually the main input of drugs and, and metabolites or xenobiotics are coming with the food. So it makes a lot of sense that when mice are eating and they're processing the food, this uh, system has to be very active in the liver. And then, um, actually, there was some metabolic data. Unfortunately, it was not as, as long time series as uh, our proteome. But in blue lines, it's a bit complicated, this graph, but the blue lines are the levels of xenobiotics that people had um, quantified in this metabolome and it, um, as experiment. And then you can really see that all the profiles of these enzymes are really, really following the levels of the xenobiotics. Again, telling you that it doesn't matter when you transcribe, uh, transcribe these genes, but you know, proteins have to be there when they are needed, right? Um, and of course, um, the next question for me is like, okay, you um, control metabolic or, or organ physiology uh, with uh, protein levels, but what about protein function? Uh, maybe proteins don't need to really change in abundance to really be more or less fun functional across the day. And then, basically, the way I, I tackle this is like I wanted really to look at phosphorylations. Are phosphorylations changing across the day? And this is also changing the, the protein function. And uh, this is the experimental workflow that I follow. So the same um, time collection or tissue collection uh, paradigm here, every three hours for mice. 
In, the ca in this case, we did label free. We didn't use Silac anymore because the label free was out and it was very practical. I didn't have to do a spiking and so on. And then I used uh, the EC4 uh, platform of uh, phosphorylation of phosphopeptide enrichment developed by Sen. Uh, Sean uh, Humphrey in the lab, and then Masquan and Perseus. So um, at the phospho level in the liver, so we could actually quantify more than 20,000 phosphopeptides. And from those that actually I have to filter out, because this is one of also a, a little bit of a problem in this large time series data set, is that you don't have maybe quantification in all the time points, in all the replicates. And I think doing a statistics when 20,000 20, phosphopeptides, when you don't have even 50% of your samples uh, with quantifications, then it's not fair. So basically, I, I tend to always quantify or filter out those entries uh, that are actually not quantified in, in at least 50% of the samples. And when I do this, I end up with almost 8,000 phosphopeptides, and uh, this is the level of, of oscillation. So 26% of phosphopeptides are changing abundance in the mouse liver compared to the 6% at the protein level. And then if I look at where are these uh, phosphopeptides uh, localized, so this is proteins that have at least one phosphorylation uh, peptide. And then I can really see that in almost 40% of the proteins with a phosphorylation are changing in abundance of this phosphorylation in the mouse liver. So actually, you really regulate greatly uh, the phosphorylation level if almost half of the proteins in the liver in a daily manner. So when I look at, uh, maybe also linking this enrichment analysis that Jorgen mentioned yesterday about, so I look at um, where are the pathways that are regulated by phosphorylation, and you do this with a uh, Fisher exact test enrichment factor, or um, enrichment analysis, and you can get an enrichment factor, everything that is actually, um, maybe you don't read it from, from the back, but everything that is green here is something that is not necessarily very enriched, so it's lower than one, so actually not enriched, and this is the p-value of the test, and uh, to my surprise, I found that drug metabolism is actually not enriched uh, uh, in, in those proteins that are regulated by phosphorylation because I already saw them that they are changing a protein abundance, actually. So there are two layers of regulation. But I can actually see that many other uh, critical aspects or metabolic aspects in the liver are regulated by phosphorylation, like insulin signaling pathway. And one that came out is circadian rhythms. So I have to say that it's very difficult to to find um, the, the circadian proteins uh, in any of these studies because actually half of the day they are absent, so they are completely um, um, degraded and you don't quantify them. But the phosphorylation level is easy to find them because the phosphorylation uh, actually changes in high amplitude. I can really see that this is one of the using phosphorylation um, uh, uh, data you can really see this pathway nicely oscillating that we know that is happening. Anyway, so these nice uh, heat maps, I'm sorry that I changed the color, it's a bit uh, <laughs> driving crazy, but now in this case it's red uh, high and blue low. Every entry here is a phosphopeptide, and you can really see that there's nice patterns of changes across the 24 hours. Again, between day and uh, one and day two is very similar. So um, here, just to put you in perspective, so if I take the phases, so the peak, of the expression of these phosphopeptides, and I, I take globally and I represent, you know, at 24 hours, you know, you can see that the main cluster is really peaking here in the day, and there's a small cluster in the night. And if I do this with the proteins, actually, you see that the distribution is very different. So again, you know, so mRNA distribution, cycling mRNA distribution, protein mRNA distribution, and phospho -MR uh, phospho um, cycling distribution is very different. So you have three levels of regulation. And actually, something that we also saw that the amplitude, so the difference between maximum and minimum in the cycling phosphoproteome, it was at least four times or five times uh, larger than the protein level. It makes a lot of sense because I guess it's easier, metabolically speaking, to create high amplitudes of phosphorylation changes more than protein abundance changes. Um, and going back a, a little bit how you can do this, uh, so there's actually a very nice option in Perseus that it does an, uh, does an enrichment test, but it's not like I showed you before, you know, you enrich, okay, this is the cycling peptides or phosphopeptides versus the total peptides, not necessarily cycling, and I can see these pathways that are regulated by phosphorylation. But in this case, I wanted to actually look at maybe from this uh, pattern, you know, can I predict kinase activity by actually uh, having annotations of many of these peptides are if uh, some of these peptides are substrates or non-substrates of certain kinases. Can I predict when these kinases are, for, are active by the, actually the phase or, or the pattern of 
of the non-substrates, right, in, in abundance here. And then you can do this in Perseus with uh, something that is called uh, cycling annotation enrichment. And it's basically it's an enrichment test, but it takes actually annotations and it looks in a certain time uh, in your data set. And the time for me is the phase, you know, I think the formana, so I have this column that Perseus gave me with the phase, with the peak of the expression, in this case, and the, phospho uh, the phosphopeptide level. And then how does it look? And then I use phosphocyte plus annotation um, as a annotation to look at enrichment. And I have to say here, you have to change this because when you, the phosphocyte plus is a text column when you add the annotation, so you have to change the text column, which are the kinases known for each uh, peptide or each sequence, you have to change it to annotation column to use this uh, analysis. So this, in the time series here um, um, button, you have this periodicity analysis that I showed you before, and bef uh, up here you have cycling annotation enrichment. When you click here, you have, it's very similar to, to the Fisher exact test, but the only difference is that it looks at phases. In this case, because Jorgen did it for me, so it's called phase because this was the time uh, parameter, and then again, you can really do the cutoff as you, that you want. Of course, because in this case, uh, we are looking at uh, kinase annotation, so you, we don't have to do this any relative enrichment, but if I want to look at, for example, metabolic processes that are annotated in a time-dependent manner, uh, or enriching a time-dependent manner based at the phospho level, I have to actually click here relative enrichment uh, at the protein level because, of course, every peptide, every protein might have 20 different peptides and, of course, you are overestimating this. But in this case, you know, the relative enrichment is off. And doing the, uh, that, uh, that with Perseus, I got a number of kinases that are predicted based in the abundance of, of peptides that are known to be substrates across the 24 hours. And Perseus gives you, the, of course, the, the FDR, or the p-value of the enrichment, and also the time that these kinases are supposed to be enriched, basically uh, activated. And then I represented here in, a 20, in this uh, scatter plot. And the nice thing is that now, uh, actually going back uh, to the data, and I uh, have ERK1 predicted to be phosphorylated, and I go, and I represent here non, very, really curated substances of ERK1. I can really see that many of them here, they are color, color coded if they, they are picking at, in the day, they're yellow, at night is blue. And you can see the majority of them are indeed picking uh, during, the, during the day. And the same uh, in opposite phase, obviously, for mTOR uh, substances that are very well known. And something that I, I did uh, also in Perseus is like, can I actually, based in the patterns of these substances that are known to be um, uh, regulated by ERK, which is uh, actually time dependent, uh, regulating a time dependent manner, can I actually go back, I'm sorry, go back to the data and predict novel substrates of these uh, kinases. And in this case, I took um, uh, the, the ones, actually, so I think I used 10 in this case, maybe for ERK, very non substrates or very non peptides with sequence for ERK. And I did, I'm sorry, this is jumping. Um, I did um, the mean of the average of the profiles of these peptides. And I'm sorry that I didn't do a screenshot for Perseus, but there is an option for profiling. So you can do the profile of your data. And you can also do a statistical test to look at close profiles of whatever the profile that you are established as, as the one that you want to take. Uh, for comparison. So basically, this, this yellow or orange line is the mean of these peptides that are non really substrate of ERK. And then these, uh, these uh, symbols here are actually the profile of the, mo the closest, I think it was 20 profiles of phosphopeptides that really fo follow very similar patterns statistically. Also, you can do different cutoffs with this profile um, analysis. And uh, actually, when I take all of these peptides, they really have a consensus sequence for ERK. And the same one was for AKT, which is actually predicted to be activated in the middle of the night. Again, you know, so this is the main profile of all the really curated substrates or, or peptides with sequences, and the rest are really potential new um, peptides or, or new sequences that are regulated by AKT. So uh, this is a complicated slide, but I just, I just wanted to show you, and this is a, a part of it. So I did a lot of manual curation. So what are all these phosphorylations meaning, right? So um, based in the kinases that we predict to be phosphorylated, I established two main pathways. Based most of this, I went back to the literature and tried to make signaling pathways of most of these processes that are annotated and, and phosphorylation. So you have, again, 
these balls that are um, um, orange, are phosphorylations are picking during the day and in blue during the night. And of course, you can also apply different cutoffs, right? Because something like 0 0.1 maybe is also still cycling, but you know. Um, basically, the two main pathways that are regulated by phosphorylation is downstream of EGF or, or growth factor receptor, where you have air can make activated in the middle of the day, while at night the main signaling pathway that is regulated by phosphorylation involves mTOR. And I just wanted to, I don't go into the details, this is published, but I just wanted to just highlight something that the signaling pathways end up in the nucleus and a lot of phosphorylations are happening in transcription factors uh, that are changing across the day. Again, you know, saying that transcription is also regulated in a circadian manner by phosphor changes. And this is basically uh, the summary of this part that uh, we have this level of transcription regulation, 10 to 20 percent. Translation is known now to be regulating a circadian manner. Uh, protein levels are also changing, a phosphorylation even a higher degree. And then these two levels are actually feeding back to transcription to regulate again, to modulate transcription in a circadian manner. And um, okay, I still have some time. Good, because I thought uh, is this all boring since everything is uh, pa published and I'm going to show you something that we are working on and we are extremely um, excited about the data. This I want to finish and I want to thank Matthias. Uh, most of this work was done in his lab and of course uh, the group of Jorgen, which has been also very helpful along the way. My collaborators in Zurich with, this, uh, with the synapses and uh, my little group and if somebody's interested, I'm hiring people. <laughs> I have to advertise this and the funding sources and thank you very much.